Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto suche doye olahuri samyao samputoshe. Wu shang shen shen wei miao fa. Bai chen wan che nan sao yu. Wo jin chen wan de shou chi. Yen che ru lai chen shi yi. The unsurpassed, deep, profound, subtle, wonderful Dharma in hundreds of thousands of millions of eons is difficult to encounter. Now that I've come to receive and hold it within my sight and hearing, I bow to fathom the thus come one's true and actual meaning. Venerable Master and Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture tonight. This is the 8th of November. We are here in Berkeley, California. We're going to be looking into the Ten Grounds chapter of the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra, ground number six. To get started, uh, please turn to the front page of your sutra booklet, and we'll invoke the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, the name of the sutra, and get going here. Namo da fang wang po wa yen ji wa yen hai hui po pu sa na da fang wang po wa yen ji wa yen hai hui po pu sa Please turn to page 12 and 13. We're going to start at the second paragraph again. Now, we were there last week, but I want to string this, these thoughts together. So. We'll repeat that first paragraph and then go on down to the end of paragraph, actually paragraph three, where it says, old age goes bad, it creates death. So from the Chinese side of page 12, we're going to start with Fuzi, the second paragraph. Okay, are we ready for that much Chinese at once? Let's try it. Let's take a deep breath and go all the way through. Here we go. Fuzi. Pu 
，随事谈欲，与心共生，心使事，事是行，与行迷惑事无名。与迷迷啊，与无名即心，共生是名色，名色增长是六处，六处三分何谓处？处共生是受。受无厌足是爱，爱舍不舍是取，彼住有之生是有，有所起名生，生熟未老，老坏未死。Okay. Over to the right. Stick with us here. Let's read together. We'll start with disciples of the Buddha. Here we go. Disciples of the Buddha, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, then thinks, everything whatsoever in the threefold realms is only a single thought. Extrapolates this one thought into twelve distinct branches, each of which depends entirely upon that one thought for its existence. Why is it so? Because thoughts and desire arise together with the deeds that are done. Thoughts are consciousness. Deeds are activities, and confusion about activities is ignorance. Name and form arise together with ignorance and thoughts, and when name and form grow, they create the six places. The six places, three divisions, combine to create contact. Contact then brings forth feeling. When feeling becomes insatiable, then love is the result. Love holds on and does not let go until there is grasping. The branches of existence creates existence. Then birth comes from existence. When birth ripens, it ages, and when age goes bad, it creates death. All right. If that is totally uh, uh, incomprehensible to you, don't worry. Stick with us. We're going to make sense of it. Let's just go through the words first, and then come back and look at the meaning, and then come back and look at how to understand that meaning. First, disciples of the Buddha. This is a speaker named Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva who's talking to other bodhisattvas. He's talking to Buddhas. He's talking to to devas, to gods, to spiritual beings who are gathered to hear the Buddha's teaching. Notice what I said was not. This is the Buddha talking. It's not. It's a bodhisattva and. It's interesting in the Avatamsaka, mostly the Dharma is taught not from the Buddha's mouth. Mostly the Buddha kind of deputizes, kind of nominates a bodhisattva to step forward and to speak for him. So that's that's kind of interesting, isn't it? At some point, it's a deva who speaks the the sutra, not a bodhisattva at all.、Uh, at least not on the surface. Maybe he's a bodhisattva in disguise, but nonetheless, it's not the Buddha's voice. So, you, now you could flip everything I said around and say it is the Buddha's inspiration; it's the Buddha's intent spoken through somebody else's voice. So, does that sound、uh, mysterious? It is. It's really mysterious. They call that inconceivable, bhuka sui, but it's part of the Buddha's samadhi. That when he enters into that profound stillness of mind, he is able to.、Um, Find spokespersons for what for the Dharma that he wants to teach.、Um, do they become like zombies, controlled by some other you know、uh, demonic power? Well, we've seen too many movies if that's what we think. It's actually, I think, much more scientific than that. It's the idea that the Dharma is in each one of us. It's kind of coded into our nature, deep inside the. Our true minds. We have these principles already there, and what the Buddha did, you know, our prince, our hero, who left the palace and went to cultivate, he simply was already there. 
It's not that he invented the Dharma, that he wrote the Dharma, um, that he like authored. It's not like that. It's that he simply was reporting what his wisdom eyes saw in the world, what's really going on. So when he taps a bodhisattva who's capable, who has this kind of samadhi, the bodhisattva does the same thing. Potentially, each one of us could be a Dharma speaker. We're all fully qualified, but we just haven't opened up that level of stillness and clarity inside. So when I say it's scientific, in a deep way, it is. Um, our instruments can't see that because it's part of the of layers of the human mind that are accessible only with the experience of precepts, concentration, and wisdom. But historically speaking, whenever anybody does this, all that wisdom opens up. Okay, so mysterious, yeah, because we can't really see what's going on. Not mysterious because, from the Buddhist point of view, this is simply the way things are. Okay, so this Bodhisattva is speaking. He says. Disciples of the Buddha, Fozi, that's he's addressing people there and us now here. Okay, disciples of the Buddha. He says, this Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, uh, who is cultivating the six the, the, to the sixth ground stage, has a thought. What is he doing? He's taking us into the mind of the Bodhisattva. Very interesting. Kind of like uh, profound psychotherapy. He says, here's how he thinks. If you were a sixth ground, sixth stage bodhisattva, here's what you would be thinking right now. You would be thinking, Sanjaya Soyo, everything whatsoever in the universe. What are the Sanjaya, the three realms? Just, that's another way of describing the universe. The desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. Everything, everything that exists in those realms, Wei Shi Yi Xin. Okay, now this is powerful stuff. This is like... Um, Let's look at it word by word. Only is one thought. Only is one mind. Everything in the whole world is a single thought. And you go, mm. you know, do I understand that? Is, is, could he be right? What if he's wrong? How could he be wrong? How could a bodhisattva be wrong? So we want to unpack that. We've got a couple seats here. Don't be shy. Empty seats. Please fill them up. Um, Everything, everything in the whole world is a single thought. Wei Shi only is a single thought only. All right. Now, let's, let's not panic at that or, or reject it immediately. How could that be? Well, in order for that to be so, we have to adjust our understanding of what one thought is. Right? For us, for me right now, one thought is like, I know I have them. I see them rise, I see them fall. Um, I listen to them all day long. I'm pushed around by my thoughts. Sometimes I have a thought that I like, that I think is a good one. Other times I have thoughts that I, I'm really clear are bogus, nasty thoughts that I don't trust. I know I've got them. But what do those thoughts contain? What is their power? What can they do? Mm, mostly I'm just a spectator to those thoughts. I watch them rise, I watch them fall. It's hard to get a, um, any traction. It's hard to get any, like, if you hold something up and put a light on it, you see the shadow and then you can get the depth of it. You get that third dimension. It's hard to get any dimensions on thoughts because mostly they're, they're too quick. They're ephemeral. They're like the tracks of a bird. Whew. The bird flies by, does it leave a track? Well, some people say, yeah, but for me, it's just it's gone. You know? My thoughts are like birds flying by. They're gone. Now, the Buddha, because, and this potentially you, it's not the Buddha, some alien being, you, when you enter samadhi, when your mind is still and calm and, cl and clear, then these thoughts are distinctly different than me in my conscious mind, where thoughts are kind of just like a, you know, if you watch doctors' TV dramas, right, and they, the camera flashes to the oscilloscope and it goes, doot, 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 doot. We've been watching a doctor's film on uh, lunchtime. So it, we're, we've seen lots of oscilloscopes, right? 
the doctor will go, vital signs, their normal doctor, you know, dee dee, dee dee, you know, blood pressure is falling, doctor, you know, those things. That's what a thought is. Dee dee, it's like that. It's a blip on the scope. Nothing more than that, right? Bleep, bleep, bleep. It's gone. So in samadhi, thoughts are different. And we've actually had, um, we had a description back in the fifth ground about the bodhisattva's amazing ability to see in his or her stillness the entire process of birth and death, of coming into being and passing away of entire worlds. Not just people getting old, getting sick and dying and being reborn, but worlds and all beings in them, all in a single thought. That's what the mind is like when it's calm and quiet. So, if you think about that, it's really funny to me that we know so little about our thoughts. And yet, we have them every day. The, the Buddha described thoughts like waves on the ocean. If you go over to the Great Highway and watch, or if you go to you know, Baker Beach and watch over there, go down to the bay. The waves are smaller, but there are waves there. You watch, the waves come in, hit the shore, come in, hit the shore, they come in. That's what they do. From day one on planet Earth till it breaks up, that's what they do. They hit the shore, hit the shore, hit the shore, like that. The Buddha says our thoughts are exactly the same. They rise and fall, rise and fall, rise and fall, and yet we pretty much pay not much attention. We don't pay much attention to our thoughts. If we get into a state of anxiety, our thoughts can really scare us. If we get into a state of depression, our thoughts can seem like they weigh a million pounds pushing us down. But when we're happy, our thoughts are like joyful and fluttering like Walt Disney birds, you know, or Tinkerbell flipping around, pixie dust. Thoughts are like that. But Who's in charge? What's going on? Clueless. We don't know. We don't know. And yet, not a being doesn't have thoughts. Um, I was watching a cat video, I confess, a cat video today. And the cat video was guilty cats, right? We've all seen the guilty dogs, right? The guilty dogs has got like 31 million hits at this point. But there was a guilty cats video. And I, I laughed out loud. Because, you know, you mostly you think of cats as kind of staring you down. They're haughty and they're like, of course I did that. Of course I kicked the vase off the counter. I was supposed to. The vase fell. It broke. I had nothing to do with it. You know? Cats are like that, right? These cats are not. The cats are like, mm, their ears are down. Mm. Very, very funny. The cat is having thoughts. Obviously the cat is having thoughts that I shouldn't have done that. Damn it, I'm caught. I'm red-handed. You know? <sighs> I hope they don't take away my kibble. So the cat is like, obviously, everything about the cat is like crunched in. They know they made a mis- there's thoughts happening in the cat. We all have thoughts, and yet, what's going on with the thoughts? Stop them. You don't stop waves in the ocean. You're going to stop your thoughts? Yeah, die. Then your, th- your thoughts stop. Before that, no. And yet, we don't know. We just don't know. We'll go to war to destroy com- countries, to, you know, to blow up bridges and buildings and overthrow government. We won't get involved with our thoughts. We don't want to get our hands dirty. Until somebody manifests like truly neurotic behavior. Neurosis, psychosis, paranoia, schizophrenia, all of the mental illnesses, right? And then what do you do? Give them a pill. Feed them a chemical to suppress them. Make the symptoms go away and you're happy. So, clueless. We're totally clueless. Everything in the entire world, wei shi yi xin, single thought only. What do you make of that? It's like, uh, the Buddha's on to something. <laughs> Tell me more? You know. Who gives us that clue? Who shows where? to start going into your thoughts. 
Well, interestingly enough, in the midst of this, the Buddha never ever said, okay, if you want to find out about thoughts, come to me. You know, I've got an appointment Thursday afternoon from four to five, uh, you know, fill out the forms. No, he said, sit still, watch your character, you know, calm down your habits, you'll tune into your thoughts. You're, you're qualified, competent, and have everything you need to deal with your thoughts. Sit still, watch them rise, watch them fall. Don't take them as real, however they contain everything. Keep watching. Don't pay attention to them, but don't ignore them either. That's just how subtle and complex it is. Right? right. The Buddha did not say, I'm the thought wrangler. He said, you are in charge. Watch them rise and fall. Tune in, because that's where the action is. So, that's so interesting. Take them seriously, don't attach to them. That's this double message we get. Buddha says, what? Everything in the threefold realms is just one thought. The planet around you, the world you live in, your moods, your emotions, your spouse, your lunch, your vehicles, one thought. All contained in one thought. Here's how it breaks down if you want to look at it clinically, he says. If you want to take a kind of a geeky mind, you want to take a nerd's approach to this, tell me more about that one thought. Give me the schematic, right? Show me the PDF. I want to read the doc file on this single thought. The Buddha says, gotcha, you're covered. Here it is. I'm going to extrapolate. Extrapolate means I'm going to stretch that single thought into 12 distinct, it says, branch. It doesn't have to be branches. It could be steps. It could be categories. It could be items. It could be stages, whatever. Just, it's a picture of a branch. I'm going to pull this single thought out into 12 branches. Okay? And all of those 12 branches return back again to a single thought. Jie yi xin. Okay, jie yi yi xin. Is that four first tones in a row? Yeah. Jie yi yi xin. All of those 12 branches return to one thought. Ru shi er li. That's how they're set up. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a lecture by, we have a, it's actually a kind of a, a tech talk, you know. It's a class we have instructions from the original master psychotherapist. This person has been spelunking in his mind and he knows how it's built. I remember driving with my parents through New Hampshire. We were on our way to Quebec and uh, uh, Maybe, I guess it was Vermont. We were on Highway 7 going north. And this was a really mountainous section. We had to go through the Green Mountains. And the way they had built the highway was they just blasted. They blasted through the mountain and used a really, really sharp uh, shovel, you know, a, a huge crane, a caterpillar tractor or something, so that wherever the highway had gone, it's as if they had taken a big spoon and just scooped out the roadbed from the mountain. Because, why? On both sides of the highway, we had two lanes, there were two lanes in the median. On both sides, the road, the side of the road was in layers, just like a layer cake, right? Just like cornbread that has layers in it. Cornbread doesn't have layers. What has layers? Like a birthday cake, right? You cut through and there's like layer, layer, layer. And you could see, if you were like a geologist, it was a field day, because you could see like, you know, the, the, the rock changes color. Here's shale, here's sand, here's granite, here's, uh, you know, uh, what are they? Fossils and just sliced right through cleanly. So you could see that the ground is layered like a cake. And you might say, you know, this is the Mesozoic and this is the Paleolithic and these different ages of humanity going up the, this, the mountainside. And it was so cool because you go, wow, I wish we could stop and I'd love to look at this. What is that? What is, 
layer upon layer. Here's a million years, here's a million years, here's a million years. And there's up at the top are trees, on, you know, pine trees. So, uh, very cool. That's the way you could look at the, you have a sudden, you get an insight into the age of the earth and you're rolling down the highway at the same time. So, here the Buddha is saying, okay, okay, you want to see the, you know, the geological strata of the mind? Here we go. We're going to scrape through and you get to take a look. So uh, here's what he's doing. He's saying there are 12, 12 branches that the mind is made on. Each depends entirely upon the one thought. The substance of all those strata is mind. Okay, so we're back to that basic question, what is mind, right? The Buddha is not telling us what it is, he's telling us how it works, how it works. Okay, let's take a side step here for just a second. There's a fascinating way that the Chinese have traditionally looked at knowledge. I don't know if, if anybody wants to um, write their master's thesis on this, please give me a credit in the acknowledgments. There's an amazing way of approaching knowledge that the Chinese have used for centuries, and it's called ti xiang yong. So if you want to know what something is, you're, you're met by something new and different, you ask three questions. You say, what's it made of? Two, what does it look like? And three, what does it do? And by answering those three questions, you pretty much know what something is, right? T, substance, body. What's it made of? Is it made of animal, vegetable, mineral? Okay, and once you answer that question, you've got the, the stuff of it. And then xiang, what does it look like outside? As your senses look at that, you think, oh, it's red, it's bright, it's soft, you know, you start looking at it and you, it's bigger than a bread box, smaller than a whale, you know. Um, so, xiang, what's its appearance? So what's it made of? What's its appearance? And then the third one is yong. You say, what does it do? How does it react? How does it move? Is it st stationary? What's its velocity, right? Does it make noise? Does it bite? You know, will it stick me if I pick it up? So, ti xiang yong, substance, appearance, and function. Sometimes they added a fourth one, which is mean. What's it called? Because when humans interact with it, we want to give it a name, right? Name and form. So, that's a, a very useful traditional way of looking at things you want to know about. How do you approach new, how does contact go to knowledge? Well, what's it made of? What's it look like? What's it do? What's it called? So, ti xiang yong. So, the Buddha's doing that. That's what he's doing here. And he's talking about how when you stretch a thought like that, and you have the wisdom and the stillness to see it clearly, you can distinguish 12 different layers inside that thought. And he's saying, it matters a lot. It really counts to know about these, because why? Birth and death and suffering or liberation from that suffering is contained in there. If you see it clearly, if you then know how to deal with it, how to react to it, you can end suffering. If you don't, well, it's business as usual. Okay, so, okay, so far so good. That's kind of that first paragraph. Okay. Now, from the words sui shi tan yu all the way down to lao hui wei si is the description of what those 12 branches do. Those are the 12 strata of a thought. And we're, you know, we're translating this as we go. It's been translated, but uh, we haven't published this yet. Uh, we, Mas Master Hua lectured on it back in in uh, the, uh, the 1970s, 
And 40 years later, you know, we're bringing it out. And the English that you encounter on this page is what you call uh, provisional, right? It's our best effort to date. It's open to further understanding. This is a rough draft, okay? Your participation is not only encouraged, it's invited. Okay, we want people to get involved in this because why? Number one, we want to know what it means. We really do. What, what do the Buddhists say? Now, why is it tricky? It's tricky because over on the left page, is that what the Buddha said? Nope. That's Chinese translators' best attempt at rendering Sanskrit. It was written down in an Indian language. Is the Indian language the words the Buddha spoke? Are those Indian languages? We honestly, we don't know. We don't know. He probably spoke something like Prakrit, which is one of the spoken forms in India at the time. But even that Prakrit, did the Buddha like just say, okay, everybody sit down, get out your audio recorders on your phones, I'm going to speak the Avatamsaka Sutra. He didn't. He had a bodhisattva speak it, and who heard it? Maybe you had to be in samadhi to hear it. Maybe it wasn't even spoken language. We honestly don't know. In any case, because why? 2,500 years ago, right? A lot of years have intervened. However, what I said earlier still holds true, which is the Buddha didn't author this. He reported what he saw in his mind at that level of stillness in samadhi. So, and he didn't own it once he spoke it. He said anybody who goes that deep in their mind can see this dharma and bring it forth. Don't go for it. Do it, please. You know, It's not Buddha circle R. I own the Avatamsaka at all. It's inner samadhi, this wisdom, is freely available. So that's another factor as we're trying to translate this, is every bit of stillness that we can manage in our own practice helps us actually connect to what's going on. And I have that experience when I'm translating, which is, it kind of goes, there's this faint echo far away. It's like, oh, that sounds kind of familiar, but it's like, huffing on your camera lens and putting your thumbprints on it and then taking a picture. It's really blurry. You know, it's not super crystal clear. But as much stillness as you can muster in your, in your meditation, that's how much the camera lens is polished off and this comes into focus. All right? So, why I said that is I want people to understand that these words and these words are approximations of what the Buddha was trying to say. And that's why when we come here on a Saturday night or wherever you encounter the sutra, before we open it up, we sit down, get still, we request dharma, we chant the name of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas for their light, for their uh, inspiration and their aid. And then we try our best, you know, sincerely to say, what's going on here? What is this all about? So, um, our teacher, Master Hua, said that was so important to do that he did it every single night that he was physically in America. And if he wasn't in America, wherever he was, he did it there. He said, we have to turn the Dharma wheel. These insights are too important to just leave in a, you know, in a bookshelf over there or over there. You got to open them up, quiet your mind, and try your best. Because why? If you can understand this, your life changes. Things are different. Okay. So here we are trying to make sense. He could have given us a list. He could have done ignorance, conditions, activities, activities, conditions, consciousness, consciousness, conditions, name and form, name and form, condition, the six entrance of the six. He could have done the 12 like we did last week. Last week we threw it up on the screen so you could see the traditional classical way of describing the 12 links. But now 
we have it in a different form. It's kind of like the Buddha shuffled the cards in a different way, if we have that metaphor. Somebody who's good at card tricks, the cards seem to kind of turn like water and they flutter around and you see this hand and they flutter around and they're snap, 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 oh, pick a card, oh, put it back in. The same Dharma is coming out in a different form. This is a prose way of talking about the 12 links. It's not a list. Okay, often it's a list. Here it's not a list. Here it's massaged into prose. Shuffle the cards. Here they are. Take a look. Okay, sui shi tan yu, yu xin gong sheng. According with things that happen, greed and desire and the mind arise together. So far so good? No, I don't get it. Okay, try again. Because thoughts and desire arise together with the deeds that are done. That's a because. What is the because answering? It's answering the question above. Why does everything come from a single thought? Okay, how come that's true? The answer is that's true because when you do things, when we do things, in other words, what activities Guess what happens? Thoughts and desire come up out of stillness, out of nothing going on, out of everything being in harmony and balance. We do stuff. We go out and kill somebody violently for food, something. We get together and kill a mastodon or we trap a squirrel into a pit and kill it with slingshots. We go to war with our neighbor. We elect a lot of Republicans into the Congress. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. Don't say that kind of thing. Stop that. Erase. We do ignorant things, and we don't know why, but once it's done, what happens? Thoughts and desire arise with the actions. So once it's done, once the karma is created, then we have thoughts and desire that come together. They're linked. They yuan. They pull it along. They tug it along, right? They link. They condition it. Okay? So, sure. According to whatever you do, greed and desire come forward with thoughts. Because once you stir that water, the ripples go out. Thoughts are consciousness. So, in other words, this is a three, three character, three word sentence that identifies what thoughts are. Thoughts are consciousness. Consciousness is thoughts. So consciousness, this thing that makes us kind of magical, we're not rocks because we have these thoughts and consciousness. Boom, the thoughts arise. Shi, shi xing, the things that we do. Now, I gave us some horrible things like killing for food or killing for political expediency or whatever reason, uh, going to war, etc. It could be positive, wholesome things plant a seed. We go out in the garden and plant some tomato vines, some starters, right? Put them in the soil. That's a shi, here, something we did. And in the mind, we think, ah, you know, three months from now, ripe tomatoes. Shi, shi xing, the things that we do are activities. And the activities, yu xin, mi huo, shi wu ming. When we act and we act without any awareness of what we're doing, ignorance is the result. Or ignorance comes together, they're tied in together with delusion and behavior. But most of the time, if we act because of instinct, if we act because of greed, desire, anger, delusion, then we're in the dark, but we've done it. We've taken a step into the darkness. We've pulled the 12 links forward. They're now connecting. When ignorance and the mind rise together, what do we get? We get the mind naming and forming. Suddenly our six senses are now involved, right? When names and forms arise, then the six senses contact 
with these names and forms, and in the mind, the ripples are going out further. The six senses, with their three divisions, past, present, future, or another way to describe this is sense, sense object, and consciousness. Eye, sight, awareness of the sight. Ear, sound, awareness of the sound. Guess what? They become contact. Those, what are called, 18 realms. Senses, objects, and consciousness interact in there, and we've got contact. Now the links are really tugging along. They're pulling one after the other. Contact, gong shang shi shou. When we contact, eyes to sight, ears to sound, tongue to flavor, nose to scent, body to touch, mind to dharma, right? What happens? There is feeling. We like it, we hate it. We love it, we reject it. We're terribly attached, we're averse, right? Show wu yan zu shi When contact is pleasant and you want to continue, continue. If it feels good, do it again. Love is born. Flip it, hatred is born. Both are powerful. They're the same link. Ai she bu she shi qu. Okay? When there's love, it grasps. It doesn't want to let go. We've got grasping. We cling to it. In the midst of darkness, we want it. Okay? Bi zhu yo, zhi sheng shi yo. Once these 12 links get to this point, all of these existence branches, then it's there. It exists as an entity in our clinging to it. Yo so qi ming sheng. What comes from that is what? Birth. Birth ripens, becomes death. Death goes bad, or I mean age, I'm sorry. Birth ripens into age. Age goes bad naturally. It just comes together, it goes apart, and there's death. So there's that 12, 12 strata in a single thought. And the Buddha just gave us the recipe, the formula for why it hurts. How come it hurts? Why do things hurt, you know? Um, Gene Pitney, only love can break a heart, right? Only love can mend it again. Did you all buy that 45 back then? You're too young. Yeah. Uh, David, did you buy 45s? Never? Oh, goodness. I bought my first one, I've told you this story many times, Town Without Pity by Gene Pitney. Oh, man. I took it to Don Freeborn's dance party in sixth grade, and I was a hit because I had the hot new 45. Took all my allowance from cutting the grass and bought Town Without Pity by Gene. Oh, it isn't very pretty what a town without pity can do. Gene Pitney, look it up. It's on YouTube, guaranteed. And the second one I ever bought was Joey D and the Starlighters singing Peppermint Twist Part 2. That was really hot. The peppermint Twist. So, um, you know, we, how did I get on to buying 45? So, uh, you gotta, if you give a digression, Jin Chuan Shi, you got to find your way back as soon as you digress. Otherwise, you <laughs> what's that? Why it hurts. Thank you, Alan. Someone's paying attention. It hurts because those 45s are no longer popular six weeks later, and you've got this suddenly unpopular piece of vinyl. You know, Throw it in your collection, you've got to go buy another one. Cut more grass, get those quarters, take it to Durdell's Stars of Tomorrow music store, and buy the next hot one, because that's how the marketplace works. So, the, what was popular today is no longer popular, so goodness, it got old and it died. So, this is the Buddha's description of that process. And it's fascinating because he just like he just took the big spoon, the big shovel, and like <laughs> took a big scoop out of this thing that we call thoughts and showed us that if you look con, um, how do they say con not convexly con if you look um, if you take if you, let's how do I describe this? If you're looking down on something, it seems one-dimensional. 
if you, you know how Google Earth changes, you can slide it this way, suddenly you realize you were just looking at the top and if you spin it and look sideways, oh, it's really deep. This has dimension to it. Our thoughts are exactly like that. They shoot by and we kind of go, hmm, yeah. Right. Let me tell you what I just thought. And it's, I know I just had it there a minute ago. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Wait, wait, don't tell me. Right? And it's gone. Because those thoughts, looking at them this way, the Buddha says, ah, look here, 12, 12 layers to each thought. And they are super powerful because they bring us happiness, grief, joy, despair, all in a single thought. And important to note, it's true for everybody. It's true for everybody who ever lived. This process of thinking, linking one to the other is mechanical. It's not personal. This is so impersonal. This is a science text. The Buddhist, it's, he might as well be describing um, how you know, seeds sprout in a jar. Everybody do that science experiment at home, all of you kindergarten, first, second, and third grade teachers, science class, right? You take a alfalfa seed and moisten it and put it under a wet paper towel and keep it wet and you look and there's this little green thing and then you, you know, it comes out and the green blossom, step by step. That was in the little seed all along, right? The Buddha's saying exactly like that. This is exactly what's there. It's a recipe. If you uh, open the can, pour the can into the saucepan, turn the heat on in the stove and stir it occasionally and you, you know, salt and pepper it and it comes out and it's tomato soup. Hot and yummy. And if you just look at the can, it doesn't look yummy at all, right? You have to open it, heat it, season it, and it's really good. It's mechanical. It's a mechanical process, okay? Here's the Buddha's wisdom. Now, is there compassion here? Uh -uh. This is pure prajna wisdom. Plenty of seats down front. Don't be shy. All right. So, this is not compassion's sound. This is wisdom's sound. The Buddha is unpacking it for us and saying, do you recognize this? Well, probably not until you sit still. But anybody who Anybody who uh, sits still long enough can verify exactly what's happening. This is exactly what's happening. And it's happening to every, every creature that has thought. Not just every human, but, you know, Adolf Hitler, everybody's favorite whipping boy. He had these thoughts running through his mind. Jesus had these thoughts running through his mind. Jesus of Nazareth, right? Your grandmother, you know, your descendants will have these same processes going through. And the Buddha is saying, this is what I saw when I sat still long enough to look at thoughts. We're on page 12 and 13, our Shasanya. Okay? Ah. I've been talking so much trying to explain this. Try and and I, I don't want to like defend it. It's not that I have to speak on behalf of the Buddha. I want to open it and give people a chance. Because frankly, when I look at this, if my mind isn't steady and still, I bounce off it. It's like, bonk. How could, you know, mm, 12, 12 anything is too many. <laughs> 12 links, no. Do you, you have a three link? You know, I can do three. Uh, but I don't want to do that. I want people to give it a chance. So that's why I'm, feel myself kind of apologizing for it. it. It's not. It's hard to approach from ordinary consciousness. Because I'm telling you something that is essentially not going to be your experience or mine, honestly, until you sit still. If you can sit still long enough, these you get a sense of ignorance, right? And nothing's going on in ignorance. I had uh, one of the uh, 
uh, one of our uh, laywomen last week, at the end of the lecture, she came up and she said, now, when I was growing up, everybody told me ignorance was bliss. Isn't that good enough? Can't we just let it be blissful, ignorance? <laughs> she wanted to argue that it was, you're better off not knowing. <laughs> you know? I suppose, you know, that's true. The problem is, with ignorance comes me and mine. And ignorance is bliss if self is bliss. And all the troubles begin when I think I'm really here and this is really mine and you get out of my way. Don't touch mine or I want yours too. You reach for it. Suddenly there's another self over there in blissful ignorance who says, no way, dude, bang, you know, or boom. If the self were okay, then it's cool. Ignorance is bliss. But the absence of ignorance, when ignorance is over, the self is over and suffering ends. So that was my response to her. You know, ignorance can be bliss if you think the self, greed, anger, delusion, and affliction are bliss. And my experience is not so. Not true. Okay, so ignorance is bliss. Mm, common wisdom, lack common ordinary thinking, ignorance is bliss. The Buddha's wisdom, no, ignorance is suffering, and suffering is less than blissful. It's where all the uh, mischief happens in the dark. So I get that. I get that when I'm sitting still and when I'm meditating, things are pretty good. You know, I feel like I finally found the center. I'm grounded and I can kind of set my burden down for as long as I'm sitting there. And then a thought arises and I think, wonder what's for lunch. And then I think, oh no, we forgot to call to tell them how many are going to be here. It's too late now. If I call, they probably already started cooking. It's too late if it's embarrassing. If they've already cooked, they've wasted money. It's your fault. You've just burned more blessings. Why didn't you think of it sooner? <coughs> Smells pretty good. I wonder what's there. How many of us are there? Let's see. I hope there's enough cake left over. There's some birthday cake left over. There wasn't enough for three of us, though. There's only two of us, so I'll take half. Okay. Right? And it's like, out of nothing comes a... And sure enough, there's me, mine, desire, right, wrong, you know, every time. And that's harmless, like, food desire, right? As soon as it's like uh, you're breaking up relationships because of that kind of thought. You're destroying companies because of that kind of thought. You're voting for the, those clowns. That's that kind of thought, you know. <sighs> So, big and small, it's all a single thought, says the Buddha. Wow. Thank you, World Honored One. You know, I can't quite use it yet, but it sure sounds compelling. Maybe when my samadhi gets together, I'll see this for myself, and I'll be able to act wisely, make the right choices. Okay, so far so good. Comments, questions? Anybody online have a like pithy statement to add to this? It's tricky because I'm describing something I don't experience yet. And maybe your samadhi allows you to see this. That's why prajna is a tough act. Because you're saying emptiness, mm, empty of intrinsic nature from the point of view of a meditator. Empty of anything that exists or, here's the way you can understand emptiness, it's born of conditions. There's nothing that is not created out of conditions. Not empty like nothing there. It's created, condition-born. Right? Kong xing yan sheng. Right? Empty in nature, but born of conditions. Everything, everything, everything. That's how you understand emptiness. Moving on. Fuzi, down at the bottom, page 12. Here we go. 
佛子此中无名，有二种业：一令众生迷于所缘；二与恨作恶，与、呃、行作生起因。Tricky, tricky, hard to, hard to explain. Disciples of the Buddha, there are two kinds of karma created by ignorance. The first kind confuses living beings about what's conditioned, and the second kind provides the cause for the arising of activity. Okay, the Buddha is going to hold this prism up to the light and get light from another from another angle.、Um, when you were a kid, did you did you encounter those items in the world that had magic with them that were powerful? What am I talking about? Magnets, remember magnets? The first time you encountered a magnet, I can remember the first time, and it's like two of them, two magnets, and if you put them, they go boom. Suddenly, it's like, and you turn it, and it goes boom, right? Magnets. This looks like a stone. It's got power. Okay, what else? Magnifying glass. Remember your magnifying glass? What's the first thing you do? Burn some ants, right? Oh, right. First thing you do. Turn it on your little brother. You know,、ah, mommy. What do you do with a magnifying glass? Remember, it has power, right? It's an amazing thing. Another one.、Uh, when was the first time you saw a gyroscope? Right?、You、wrap it up with string and go whizz in it. Remember? It shouldn't stand up, but it does. Right? Magic stuff. These amazing little things. Another one was prism. Did you ever get a prism? Right, prism is like a three-sided glass thing, and you turn it to the light, and the light comes out all different colors. Okay, these twelve links are a prism. The Buddha is holding a prism up, and he's saying, "Turn it this way, blue light. Turn it slightly, green light. Turn it again, red light comes out of the prism." Right. So here he is turning it. Slightly again, saying, "Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna change my metaphor. We're gonna shuffle the cards again, the deck of cards, and whoo, show you a card trick. Same cards, whoo, different, right? Kings over aces, whoo, 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 queens. Whoo, like that. So, disciples of the Buddha, there are two kinds of karma created by ignorance. Out of ignorance, we do two kinds of things. He says, the first kind is confusing." To us, what are we confused about? We're confused about how things come about. What is conditioned? We're confused about what it is. We're confused about what it is. Okay, and why? We're in the dark. We don't see it all. We see the view from on top. Turn it sideways. Oh my God, it's this big. But it was. We only saw it from on top. We didn't notice that it was really deep. Okay. Oh, it's way more complicated than I thought. Two. It has the function of pulling activities along. So it's got an identity. It's got a function too. It's got a T and it's got a Yong. Okay, substance and a function. Okay, what do we mean? Here's an example. There's the karma coming out of ignorance. I remember really, really clearly being 16 years old. Not quite 16. My was like, let's say it's September, and my birthday is in October, and I'm 16. As soon as you get your driver's license in Ohio, you are free. You have wheels. You are king of the road. You're out of here, right? The family station wagon, ooh, Pontiac station wagon. You want to go, right? So you can't wait till you're 16. You can take your driver's test, and if you have a good dad, he teaches you how to parallel park. Then you get the book and you practice. You know, you learn the speed limits and what the signs mean, and when two cars meet at the intersection, who's got the right of way, and stuff like that, right? Because you're going to take that test, 
And all the, they talk to each other about the test of brothers. Big brother tries to scare you. You know, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. And then it's like the driver's test. When you get those keys, you're free. Freedom. And then you get your driver's license. And what do you, that's not enough. Family station wagon, that's not cool. You want your own wheels. You want your own car. And 16-year-olds are not known for their wisdom, their insight, their subtle understandings of the real world, right? You just want that car. You want the car. Bad. And so, boy, you got a paper route. You just you deliver newspapers. You save up your pennies, quarters, 50-cent pieces, dollars. You might get a car. And the car represents freedom, freedom. So you like work your bone, work yourself to the bone to get that car. And it's probably a used Chevy, you know, or something like that, but it's freedom. And then you get the car and your dad says, well, what kind of insurance do you want? Insurance? Yeah. You don't drive a car without insurance. Nobody said anything about insurance. You know. Well, what are you going to do if you run somebody over? Well, it's their fault, right? Not if they take it to court and sue you. You got the lawyer's fees? Oh. oh. Lawyers. Lawyer's fees. Yeah, well, you know, uh, you get that car, as soon as you drive it away, it uh, depreciates about, you know, a third of its value. You want to sell it again? You want something better later? You don't get... The, full money for it. You get like two-thirds maybe. Two-thirds? But it's, I, I bought it for this. What do you mean depreciates? You know. Suddenly freedom looks real different. Suddenly you realize, oh my God, having a car. <laughs> right? What about upkeep? Maintenance? Fuel? Gas? Oil? You know, and maintenance? Service? Oh, Terrible, terrible. So um, occasionally, and that's just where the dad comes in, tough love, tough love. I remember somebody named Tony Fee wanted a new car. Oh man, I remember that car. We had a long, I don't know if dad knew about that, but Tony and I had a long talk about a car. I remember, oh boy. I think I talked him out of it. So I, better you don't need to know, Dad. Ignorance is bliss in this case. So, so it's all right. I have a story. Um, graduated from university and needed a car. Now, I wasn't 16. I think I was 21, 20, no, 22, 23. And it was going to be my, my, I sold my Volkswagen bus and I wanted to uh, kind of travel to California so I had a friend who was not really a good friend. I think he was pretty sharp, and he took me for uh, a mark. He took me for a sucker. And he said, have I got the car for you? He said, it's a, uh, shoot, I've even forgotten the name. Well, it was only 50 years ago. What was it? It was a British sports car of which only 12 had been imported into the United States. And it was really fast. The body was made by Ghia, like Carmen Ghia, but it was like an Aston Ghia, something like that. And it was red, and it had a fiberglass body, and he took me out. He, he was trying, his name was Ed. Ed was trying to sell me on this car. So uh, I drove... I had a, I was borrowing my stepbrother's Volkswagen Beetle. Just the right car for me, right? I didn't want the Beetle. I wanted... That's what I wanted. So Ed took me to his suburban Detroit home to show me the car. And we got in and sure enough, it went mm, splutter. And he goes, oh, never mind. By the way, would you go over there and get me the oil? Then, you know, trying to... Pumped together. I was running, right? So he takes me out, and it's one of those sports cars where you don't sit, you 
lie in the seats like this and your feet are stretched out and he says, uh, never mind the wind. He says, you just put a rag in the hole there in the window and it'll be fine, you know. And, and uh, I said, w uh, what about heat? He says, heat? Oh, you don't need heat. That's okay. You get heat from the engine, you know. It's like the engine's warm and you'll be, it's, that's okay. And so we go out and he had, he lived in a cul-de-sac in the suburban neighborhood and there was a roundabout. He said, watch this. And he pegs the wheel and stomps on the accelerator and the car is going a controlled drift around the, the turnaround and I'm like you know my my stomach was over there and my body is over here and we're like that he said what do you think of that I'm going <sighs> and so we get to the straightaway and he's off and scream at the stop sign and I felt the top of my head you know at the it was a convertible, of course, right? So he said, fast, huh? <laughs> yeah, it was fast. It was really fast, you know? And he said, well, there was only 12 of them ever imported. He says, and besides, he said, uh, it's all for you because we're both alumni of Oakland University. I'll be happy to, you know, special price. Special price for you. And I thought, I, I thought maybe I better think about this, you know? So I said, okay, Ed, uh, give me your phone number and I'll go back to Toledo with my Volkswagen and let you know. So he said, okay, here's the information. He gave me a, time. there wasn't any such thing as the internet then. He just gave me a printout of the, this, this sports car, the advertisement, the description. It had won trophies in sprint rallies. That was a trophy, a prize winning vehicle, right? Never mind, no heat, no top, holes in the, in the you know, and you needed to, you all, I, I looked at his fingers and he had axle grease under every fingernail, you know, because it always required tinkering. You had to have the wrench, you know, ready. If you go 50 miles down the road, it's going to break down once. 100 miles down the road, break down twice, you know. So I, I said, okay. He said, well, he said, think about it because if you don't take it now, you know, it might be gone when you, when you come back. So don't wait. I said, okay. Ed. So I drove home. My stepfather said, well, how you doing? I said, fine. He said, uh, I think I want to buy a car. Oh, yeah? What do you got? And I said, here. He looks at it. He says, you didn't buy it, did you? <laughs> I said, no, I thought I'd come home and ask you. Good, good. I'm glad you asked. He said, well, uh, where are you going to drive this car? I said, well, I thought I'd go out to California. Um, he said, you won't get to Indiana before it, it breaks down. He said, you, you, you know, I'd give you about 150 miles before you want to sell it. What are you going to do in the winter? Uh, well, California's warm. <laughs> he said, now you better think about it, you know. He said, uh, uh, you know, if you buy the car, guaranteed six months, you won't own it. You'll, you'll have sold it because you drive it to California, you'll, first of all, how much? And I said, uh, $2,000. He said, Ooh. he said, I wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. And I'm going, you know, you just don't want me to have any fun. You want me to drive a Volkswagen the rest of my life? He says, yeah, that's your speed. He said, you <laughs> drive a Volkswagen, that's good. Volkswagen won't let you down. You can fix a Volkswagen, you know. So it's like I stewed that night and I thought, oh man, I'm young. I, this is my chance to really go to California in style. And uh, then I forget, something happened, but I was distracted. I had, to, oh, I had to, to fill out applications for the university. So like a week passed and two weeks passed and somehow I just kind of forgot about Ed and the sports car and I lost the phone number and... I got a phone call a month later, and it was Ed saying, hey, what do you think? Are you going to buy the car? He said, I'm here. You can come on up, and we can take another drive. And from a distance, I could hear in his voice this salesman edge. And he was really anxious to unload the car on me, and I could hear that just enough of a distance. And I said, Ed, I said, you know, to tell you the truth, I think it's too fast for me. He said, well... I probably agree. I don't think you're ready for it. But if you change your mind, you know, make sure you give me a call. <laughs> so I was like, Whew. and I felt that pass by. And I thought, man, if my stepfather had said, well, or if he hadn't been there, I probably would have slept on it. I might have gone back the next day. And in ignorance, I would have conditioned activities, which is handing over my money. And that would have been a big mistake. So... Ignorance conditions activities. That's what it is. 
Karma, the first kind, confuses beings about what's conditioned. I looked at that car and what did I see? I saw lifestyle, fast, you know. That's going to, I'm going to be fast. I'm going to be right in style in California, right? If somebody drove like an, an Aston Ghia down the street here, we'd all go, what kind of playboy is, you know, good luck, dude, you know. Hey, you're smoking, your tailpipe's smoking, you know. We wouldn't think it's style. We think, you mechanic, you know, good thing I don't drive that as we settle back into our, you know, Subaru Forester and when we get to the destination, we're safe and, you know, so anyway, I had, that's all it was. I didn't see the repairs, the freezing when it rains, getting wet when it rains, you know. Oh, no radio, no such thing, just noise and a, and a fiberglass body that vibrated, you know, but it's fast, really fast. You know? So won trophies, but I'm not a race driver, you know. So in ignorance, boy, oh. When I think about that, I'm so glad my stepfather said, you sure this is something you can, you can afford? You know? So, and the second kind of karma is it pulls on activities. But if in ignorance you can get the slightest bit of light, if you have a stepfather, a good advisor says, are you sure? Then there's a little bit of light and you go, well, not really. You know, uh huh, well, think about it. Think about it again. You know, tell me tomorrow. We can talk about it. You know, so I saved that. The thing I had out of it was that the printout, the, the story of the famous car. And uh, I remember, I think, 10 years later, I, I looked uh, to see the internet happened at that point. And I looked to see if there was a photo anywhere of that car. And I think he still owned it. I think Ed still owned the race car. And sure enough, there were 12 of them, you know. And if he holds on to it long enough, it'll be worth a lot, but not to drive, just to own, you know. And I'm not a rich race car driver, so. Okay, all right. So we're over to page 14 and 15. And if you'll notice, that's our last page for our booklet. So we need to, uh, we're going to definitely provide more pages for our lectures this week. I'll be translating more and sending them out for our, our uh, sutra editing committee to put together. So um, these 12 links are so essential to understanding what's going on. And you'll notice that the Buddha in, um, or Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva, is um, he's he's giving us the the information in a variety of ways. That's um, as as I translate it, and now as you all look at it, we're going to see um, the same list of twelve reshuffled and presented in different ways to keep it fresh. The Buddha wants us to see all the ramifications of 12 links of conditioned arising. And it's always the same. They pull each other, and when the link is broken, then it's over, it stops. But that sequence of 10 is, is key. And um, as I said, it's uh, wisdom. This is prajna being laid out for us. It's not compassion. It's not that kind of teaching. The application is compassion, but the awareness of it is pure wisdom. So occasionally, occasionally in popular culture, we run into similar um, provocative insights cached as questions. And this is one of them. Um, Back in 1963, if you had said Bob Dylan, um, some people would have gone, you mean Dylan Thomas, the poet? No, Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan. No, 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 not Dylan. It's like a Y, Dylan, Bob Dylan, spelled with a Y. Never heard of him, right? And then some people would go, oh yeah, 
that song, right? Yeah, that, that song was really, like, I really like that song. And it's a song that asks nine questions, and it puts them in our mind without the answer, but it provokes us to think. And he was not the one who made it famous. Peter, Paul, and Mary made it famous. He only wrote it. And there are those who will say, he didn't write it. He didn't write it. I've heard that. There's a great challenge. He bought it off a bunch of college kids. That's the people who want to defame Bob Dylan, said he didn't write the song. Well, who cares? It's one of those, this is in the, uh, this is in the canon of important songs in the 20th century. How many roads must a man walk down before you call him a man? Yes, and how many seas must the white dove sail before she sleeps in the sand? Yes, and how many times must the cannonballs fly for they are forever banned. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. The chorus is the same every time y'all can join. It goes like this. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. How many years can a mountain exist before it is washed to the sea? How many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? How many times can a man turn his head Pretending he just doesn't see. Here we go. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. How many times must a woman look up before she can see the sky? Yes, and how many ears must someone have before she can hear people cry? Yes, and how many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died. Join me. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. So those questions are no less important and no less unanswered than when they were first written, sung, published, made popular in 1963, 51 years ago. Can't believe that song has been out for half a century. And I first heard it on AM radio, believe it or not. That song was a single for a while depending on the market you were in, I guess. But the um, first time I heard it, it reached out and grabbed my ear and yuan, condition tugged along my ear because I knew it was important. It's like, are we allowed to, ask, to sing things like that? You know. 
is that okay? Can we really ask these questions? You know? It's like Bob Dylan was a voice that um, put lyrics to music asking questions that mattered. Music was supposed to be, you know, bop do bop, bop sha do bop, the peppermint twist, bop shoo bop, ba bop a shoppa do bop. That was music, right? No, it isn't very pretty, you know, Gene Pitney. And he says, how many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? You go, oh, that's true talk. Can you sing that? Am I going to like get punished for listening to this? You know, so really, truly. So Bob Dylan was so incredibly important to our lives back then and now. And he's still going. My golly, Bob Dylan is still performing. Shows up, they say, at every bowling alley and gas station dedication. If you have 150 people in a town hall in a little town and you hire him, he'll come with his band and play really loud and turn his back to the audience. And the people are down there saying, Sing, uh, Blowing in the Wind. I don't sing that anymore, he said. <laughs> Oh, where have you been, my blue-eyed son? Oh, where have you been, my darling young old? I've stumbled on the side of twelve misty mountains. I've walked and I've crawled on six crooked highways. I've stepped in the middle of seven sad forests. I've been out in front of a dozen dead oceans. I've been 10,000 miles in the mouth of a graveyard And it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard race I'm gonna fall Oh, what did you see, my blue-eyed son? What did you see, my darling young one? I saw a newborn baby with wild wolves all around it. Saw a highway of diamonds with nobody on it. I saw a black branch with blood that kept dripping. Saw a room full of men with their hammers a bleeding. I saw a white ladder all covered with water. Saw ten thousand talkers whose tongues were all broken. I saw guns and sharp swords in the hands of young children And it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard race Gonna fall And what did you hear, my blue-eyed son? What did you hear, my darling young one? I heard the sound of thunder, it roared out a warning. Heard the roar of a wave that could drown the whole world. Heard one hundred drummers whose hands were ablazing. Heard ten thousand whispering and nobody listening. Heard one person starve, many people laughing. Heard the song of a poet who died in the gutter. Heard the sound of a clown who cried in the alley. And it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's a hard, it's a hard rain gonna fall. Oh, who did you meet, my blue-eyed son? Who did you meet, my darling young one? I met a young child beside a dead pony. I met a white man who walked a black dog. I met a young woman whose body was burning. 
I met a young girl, she gave me a rainbow. I met one man who was wounded in love. I met another man who was wounded with hatred. And it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's a hard rain. Gonna fall. After the events of last election, this song has got remarkable pertinence and relevance. Oh, what'll you do now, my blue-eyed son? What'll you do now, my darling young one? I'm going back out for the rain starts a falling. I'll walk to the depths of the deepest dark forest. Where the people are many, their hands are all empty. Where the pellets of poison are flooding the waters. Where the home in the valley meets the damp, dirty prison. Where the executioner's face is always well hidden. Where hunger is ugly and souls are forgotten. Where black is the color and none is the number. I'll tell it and think it and speak it and breathe it and reflect from the mountain so all souls can see it. And I'll stand on the ocean until I start sinking and I'll learn my song well before I start singing. It's a heart, it's a heart. It's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard rain It's a gonna fall And nobody at that time had ever heard anything like that. It was like, oh, wow, that's powerful. And you sing it now, it's just as powerful. So that was what fueled the, uh, our generation. Called protest songs, called freedom songs, called, you know, uh, songs that woke the world. Sometimes people get a... Uh, Sometimes Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva gets the Buddha's inspiration. Sometimes people like Bob Dylan get a certain energy. And uh, those songs need to be sung. Okay, let us transfer the merit. And we have a lot of information to pass on, uh, things going on. So we'll get to that. If you'll look in the back of your songbook and transfer the merit.
fashion wisdom and Light break the darkness of their endless night because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. They all become compassionate and wise, they all. Become compassionate and wise. We have uh, some announcements about our upcoming Buddha, re- Buddha recitation weekend. It's three days around Thanksgiving, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, those of you, this is for those of you who are signed up. It's closed, sorry to say, um, coming up in a few weeks. But we are small here, so we have limited attendance. And those of you who are taking part, if you would like to put up a pieway, a plaque, either for the Long Life Hall, the red plaques, or the Rebirth Hall, the yellow plaques, we're going to put up boards here. And you're invited, if you're signed up, to um, put up two temporary pieways, two temporary plaques. Um, can be any combination. One would be one rebirth, one long life, two rebirth, two long lives. Up to you. Um, this is the sheet, and Jin Fosher uh, will be holding on to this, and so you go talk to him. Um, put your name down and what kind, and then we'll make out the plaque. They're temporary. They will be sent off at the end of the third day. Okay, so there that is. Um, two... We have the schedules for the three days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. These are going to be posted on the bulletin boards. You can take a look. And uh, yes, there will be one hour per day dedicated to the ancient method of reciting the Buddha's name, which is uh, survives at Donglin Se. And people who are legislating and lobbying on to not do that because Shrivu didn't teach it, um, I think you have a short memory or an inaccurate memory because why? Shrivu didn't teach us. Shrivu didn't play Dharma instruments. He said, you guys figure it out. So what we came up with was our version of what we saw in Taiwan, which is one way to do it, but it's our American version. Shrivu didn't play Dharma instruments. He and Master Jung Yin together, I mean separately, but both, didn't play Dharma instruments because too many monks and nuns spent all their time ganjing uh, chan, hustling sutras and repentances for money, right? So Sherpa said, you all figure it out. To say that's the way we do it, wrong. It's not that it's the way we're temporarily doing it. To fight over how you recite the Buddha's name misses the whole point. Okay, to say this is Sherpa's way, it's not Sherpa's way. It's what we came up with. It works. It's okay. We like it. It's not the only way. Right? Dong Lin Su is where Buddha recitation has been alive for. You go to Dong Lin Su and you see the names of the people who've recited the Buddha's name there and you get all the lofty monks of the past 900 years written there. How do they do it? That's the way they do it. It's not the way Shurfu taught us. Okay? And people who like stake their reputation. There's the way everything else is wrong. Well, fighting over the Buddha recitation doesn't get you there. Okay? So,
try something a little different. How do you do it? When I recite the Buddha's name in my mind, I do it my own way. Right? It's a little different. So just try it. Try it. You might like it. You might like it. And we're doing it for an hour because why? People are, you know, we're, we're used to one way. It's not the only way. There's many ways. And the most important thing is, can you get single-minded? Can you recite it until you and the Buddha's name become one? That's the thing to pay attention to. Not what music do you use, how many times you breathe. Get over it. You know, fighting over the Buddha's name is going to increase your afflictions. That's, that's not the point, is it? But to cite Shurfu as the way it's always done is historically inaccurate. That's not what happened. If you weren't there, take it from me, I was there. Okay? So, we're going to do that for one hour. It's going to be one to two in the afternoon. We're going to use the old Donglin Si method. It's different method. It's a good method. I kind of like it because it, it brings in more oxygen. But I don't know if, and it also has one advantage, one big advantage, which is we follow the tape. And when we follow the tape, we're always on pitch. It doesn't drop and drop and drop and drop and drop. When we do it our way, Shurfu's way, which is not Shurfu's way, we wind up, no, I'm on it. <laughs> and then somebody goes, oh, I'm on it. And you, oh, thank you, thank you. you know. Mm, it's kind of built in. So this is nice because the monks on the tape who we follow, because it's not, it's not easy, it's a traditional way, they're always right back up to pitch. And so we can always, you know, we don't have that problem. Okay, so you'll take a look at these and it involves how many periods? Oh, the important thing to know is on the first day, Friday, at 8 to 9 in the morning, we're going to transmit the Ba Guan Sai Jia, the Eightfold Precepts. If you want to take those precepts first morning, you can choose to take them for three days, for one day, your whole life if you want, but mostly not, mostly 24 hours. You know, if you're going to take it your whole life, let, let me know first, okay? And we'll check it out and you know, talk to your spouse, you know, make sure it's okay. And um, so... Uh, we will alternate sitting, walking, sitting, walking, sitting, walking, reciting. Okay? The morning is the long life transference. Afternoon is the uh, rebirth transference. So, and it goes into the evening with lectures. So, okay, here they will be. Anything else to, to point out? Alan? Alan? For some people who might be coming to the Anamitabha session for the first time or who would like some kind of orientation in English, uh, we'll be having that at 9 o'clock right after the, the eight precepts. So um, we'll have that in the dining hall. So I'll be leading that. And Jing Fo Shi will be leading the continued recitation. So we'll have the people who would like to get some kind of orientation on how to recite the Buddha's name in English, we'll have that at 9 o'clock. So... Um some people want to know what's going on, you know, with Buddha recitation, who are not uh, really clear about the, the Dharma door, the Pure Land Dharma door. So there will be a 40-minute introduction to that. You're going to have to, uh, it's going to be hard to get the Bhagwan Zajaya squeezed into one hour. So you're going to be a little loose on the, it's easy to slop over in the hour and 10, hour and 15 hour, you know, so. Okay. So, um, yes, there will be an early orientation for what's going on. Questions, comments? Um, if you want to come for lunch on those days and you didn't sign up on Saturday, for example, it's okay. We expect a large crowd, but the, the problem is we only have 60 bowing cushions and uh, there aren't that many seats in the dining room to fit everybody and we want to make sure that the people who've signed up get to sit and eat their lunch because they're going to need the fuel. So if we had a big Buddha hall, we'd say the more the merrier, you know, everyone is welcome. So uh, we've never done this before at BBM for that reason because we're not, you know, it's small. But uh, we'll try it, see what happens and might become a popular Dharma door. 
we might have to get a bigger monastery, you know, everybody like... Yeah. Okay, uh, that, that group is reciting down in the basement. They're, they're, can you hear us down there? <laughs> Turn the camera this way, Good. close circuit. I don't know, I don't know. City of Berkeley, can you imagine? Uh, there's this old church, they're going to tear it down and make a Buddhist place. <laughs> Berkeley Planning Department goes, hmm, Buddhists, huh? Okay, I think I'll go meditate over there. <laughs> yeah, Berkeley. So, okay, I um, think that's it. Other information? Um, Tuesday, if anybody's in San Francisco over at the Presidio Chapel, come and hear me speak a Dharma talk at the Veterans Day Interfaith Service. I get 10 minutes to speak Dharma. <laughs> I'm going to take my guitar. Where have you been, my blue eyes? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Probably not. Let's see. Let's see what we can do. It's been a while since we've been over at the Interfaith Chapel. We used to go there all the time. Remember, Phil? You were, yeah, all these. A lot of us went over there. So. Okay, uh, that's going to be at 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning at the Presidio Chapel. If anybody's around. Okay, I have something to show you. We're going to bring the screen down. And uh, it's, I think it's really important that we don't get through the night without seeing what you're about to see. Look who's coming down here. Good eye, mate. Ollie the Kookaburra. Okay, I told you at lunch our explanation, explanation of the 12 links is not complete without sharing with you the panda minder who's trying to give medicine to two young pandas. He's got it in a syringe and he's trying to put it into their mouths with a syringe. Open wide. I don't want it. Open wide. Come on. Oh no. I'll get okay. Now wait. <laughs> you stay there. <laughs> Don't move. <laughs> okay, I'll try you. Got one. There, bingo. Okay, now I gotta get the other. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, now I got it. Okay. Oh. Oh, there, there. There's my chance. Uh, four. He doesn't like it. Oh, wait a minute. He likes it too much. Oh, wait. <laughs> Aren't you better for having seen that? Okay. Right. Sometimes you just have to watch the video. Okay. Uh, where's the screen? The where, and the. There we go. That's it. And see you all next week for the next round <laughs> of 12 links. What's that? Didn't hear? The guilty cats.
it's, uh, it's four minutes long and there's only two of them that are really guilty. The other ones are giving you a catitude, you know. Or, uh, so. You have to look up guilty cats yourself. Okay. Oh, in respect to the Venerable Master. Namo Ha Fang 